Welcome, everyone. We hope we'll have time at the end for questions, but if you know me at all, you know that I've got loads to say. Thank you so much, and thank you to the Research Services Office for Roads to Research. What a great way for us to share ideas and current thinking and what we're doing and how we're stepping up into the world. Um, so yes, I do want to um, I do want to acknowledge the traditional territories. You know, these lands are the lands of the Lekwungen, the Esquimalt, and the Kasapsum peoples, the Songhees peoples. For thousands of years, they've gathered here to fish and forage and gather together to tell stories and share learnings and hunt and fish. And so this wasn't actually a place people lived, but it was a place they gathered. So in keeping with that lineage, here we are gathering again. So I love that we're doing that. So, and also, I want to quickly thank, where's Jamie? Jamie Clifton, my esteemed colleague, for her beautiful curation of the crayons and the natural objects and the lenses on the table. Welcome, Dr. Grundy. <laughs> the five minutes of Royal Roads. So yes, eco-psychology, a system psychology in service of all life. So, you know, just in terms of doing that introduction to the traditional lands, I always want to say, so what does that matter? Why do we do that? You know, we, we keep acknowledging things, but what does that matter? And what does an indigenous worldview have in common with eco-psychology? Now, I don't profess to know what all 630 First Nations in Canada's worldview is, and there's not particularly one worldview. However, there are common threads that speak to purpose and place and identity and culture and language. And these are the things that they share in common. Everything is alive and speaks. There is an interconnectedness to everything. Every one has a purpose. Or as Alan Watts says, the world is full of people, just some of them are human. And if you don't know where you belong in an indigenous culture, then you are surely lost. There's a sacredness to all life and an importance of stories and stories within stories as teachings as, and as remembering our place in the whole family of things. So eco-psychology is a kind of a counterbalance to traditional psychology uh, and to our systemic separation from our original intimacy and participation with the natural world. It also asks, how can we extend psychology to include the natural world, the context from which we're from, we're born, we're patterned after? And particularly taking a systems approach means we're considering these vital connections as part of the, as all the constituent parts of the whole need to be in sync, interrelating for uh, ecological health. So we move beyond treating the individual psyche and we say, aha, in this systems approach, it's more holistic. We borrow from the biology ecology model, and it really beautifully aligns with the indigenous worldview. They also, um, you know, the end of a, uh, usually a gathering will say, all my relations. Well, the indigenous worldview would say we're all relatives. So just substitute, when you say natural resources, try to substitute that for relative. Instead of natural resource, natural relative. Um, I'll say that this Roads to Research presentation might be a bit more like the Serpentine Roads to Research. I am a true interdisciplinarian, so I'm going to weave around a little bit, uh, unpacking eco-psych, um, um, moving into um, uh, talking a little bit about systems. We're going to do a, an activity, um, and then I'm going to talk more about my publications, recent ones, presentations, teaching, and how all of these practices relate back to this subject, and what's next. So first of all, just to unpack eco-psychology, because many people don't even know what that means, the word eco comes from the Greek oikos, which means home. Or I would extend that here for our purposes to say world. Uh, and psyche also comes from Greek, and it means breath, butterfly, and soul. So we'll bring soul in here. And logos, of course, is a form of study or a way of knowing. So uh, um, the etymological underpinning of this is world soul knowing. And that's understanding that everything has a soul and the world itself does too. So rather than me being in the world, I am world. So that's the shift. 
So I have some big questions. I mean, gosh, of course I do. I love to talk, but I also love, love to ask questions. So I'm looking at how a systems approach to psychology uh, can extend uh, existing psychological practices to include the natural world. You know, why does that matter? How do we integrate that into things like environmental education and communication, which is the programs I'm working in? And how might we convene teaching spaces and offer imaginative practices that foster a more attuned, embodied, and embedded approach to learning and belonging? Also, how might something like arts-based inquiry or nature-based inquiry help us to remember, as in remembering our place as part of the intrinsic whole? I think we've done a lot of forgetting. There's quite a cultural amnesia that seems to be happening in the Western world. And we have all kinds of allurements that uh, feed into that. Well, what difference might reconnection practices make in shaping worldviews, our work, how we choose to live and love and act? And what are the epistemological, so how we know, the ontological, how we are and how we mature, and ecological, even possibly evolutionary implications of teaching and learning with the earth in mind? And how might we support other each other in a commitment of reconciling, uh, you know, these separations that we've, um, we've done a, a, a job of, the, between the self and others, between the body and the mind, you know, um, we see this everywhere, this disparate dualism, and how can we, so the bigger question there would be, how can we bring soul to school? You know, just a few little questions, the kind that have no right to go away in my mind. So I'm just going to go into a little bit of a systems approach here, a high-level systems approach, just to refresh so that you know where I'm coming from with this. Um, so ecology and the web of life. Um, you know, there, in, in a systems uh, theory, there are no discrete or separate entities, and so humans are not separate from each other or from the biophysical world. Um, you know, there's no radical separation between self and other. Um, the membrane is permeable, although, as I say, we've forgotten a lot about that. We've, you know, really pulled ourselves away from, uh, in, for the most part, away from that type of uh, participation in the world. Um, and then, you know, we, it, it, as a result of that, we're living in kind of a flat land of domination and separation. And I think we're seeing the results of that right now. But mending the splits is reconciliation. That's actually how we can reconcile ourselves to the past and to our behaviors, but also to the future and how we might go forward, what the implications of this are for the possibility of our world. Uh, I really love the work of Thich Nhat Hanh. He's a Buddhist monk, and he, I think he was one of the first people to coin mindfulness, although these days I'd say mindlessness might be a better way to go, or bodyfulness. Um, uh, but Thich Nhat Hanh's idea of inner being is that there's nothing on this earth that shouldn't concern us because we're not limited to just the inside of our bodies and the boundaries of our skin, that we're much more immense, that we're part of this atmosphere. And um, uh, it, you know, there's no phenomena here that, that shouldn't concern us from the smallest pebble all the way to these galaxies light years away. And you know, I love how he makes the um, invisible visible because he says look into your bowl of ice cream and say hello cloud you know hello cloud so trace back your ice cream to the cloud so he has a really beautiful meditation on being able to trace and track everything back to its early connections and its webby um, belonging so of course uh, Colleen hello cloud <laughs> right do you want to do it for us? The rain, right? The rain, the grass, the cow, the milk, the ice cream. Right, thanks. <laughs> I knew I could call upon you. Uh, so I'm using this metaphorically. I'm looking at the bear here, and this is really a stretch metaphorically, but a systems approach might say that a grizzly bear is 5% fur, claws, and teeth, and maybe 95% forests and meadows and salmon streams, because we are our context. So the question I would ask is, what is your 95% made of? Is it malls and concrete and high rises? Is it forests and oceans and lands and some buildings? And so what are, what's the context within which you live? 
because as the context, as we're shaped by the context, we also have a way to shape that. So it's a back and forth kind of reciprocity. And when we're applying uh, eco-psychology uh, and human to human psychology, we say this wider relationship with psyche, psyche's relationship with the natural world recognizes these intrinsic connections. So we can't be the one really without the other. So eco-psychology is a systems approach. It says that the whole, the system as a whole, and as functions ver uh, due to the virtue of its relationship of its constituent parts, an assistant system has emergent properties that aren't really apparent in terms of its parts. So this is, the, this is whole on thinking. While this bear is definitely his own system, his own nervous system, his own um, you know, heart system, his own uh, functioning body, he's also part of this functioning forest system. So this, he's, within, he's a system within a system within systems. Natural systems, both human and biophysical, are wholes or holons by virtue of their relationship amongst their constituent parts. They're both wholes and parts of wholes. And so this brings me to agency and communion. A system or holon has both agency, which is kind of an inward focus, an inward looking ability to uh, self-regulate, and has a relative identity, but it also requires communion. It needs to also be in relationship uh, as into, in terms of part of the larger holon or the context. So this is the dynamic tension that uh, exists in a systems approach. And you can imagine that in human systems, in human psychology, that we need this inward reflective focus as well as this ability to commune. If we have too much of one or the other, we know that we're actually either isolating or we're, you know, uh, probably self-employed or unemployed <laughs> if we're that extroverted. <clears throat> okay, so just to wrap this systems piece up, the adaptive self-stabilization. So a system will attempt to maintain itself with respect to the larger environment. So virtually all systems that we're talking about natural systems are open systems so they have energy and information coming in from the surrounding environment but despite the flow through of matter energy and information um, and indeed thanks to that capacity systems can self-regulate so just thinking about yourself when you're uh, out in the winter and you start to get cold, well, your body will start to shake to try to warm itself up, to try to bring you up to a self-regulating, uh, more of a homeostasis to protect itself. In biological systems, uh, the regulative mechanisms in animals, including humans, maintain our body temperature, blood pressure, sugar, insulin, etc., notwithstanding variations in the environment. And then there's self-transcendence, adaptive self-transcendence. So the next step is open systems tend to return to a level of this steady state. So following a perturbation or a disturbance internally or externally in their environment. So you know that when something comes at you, you'll try to defend yourself or move out of the way or do what you need to do. Hopefully you move out of the way of a running dog that's coming at you. <laughs> and then you bring yourself back to a steady state. However, at times when challenges from the environment are really enormous and persist, a system can collapse or evolve in response to these perturbations and uh, achieve a new level of complexity and new emergent properties arise. So here's an example of this. I'm going to wander away from this thing. Um, so looking in terms of a system in terms of human psychology, in terms of eco-psychology, so here you're going along with your old status and identity, and you have a kind of a, a drop, a falling into a hole, or we might call it a back loop in systems thinking. And this is also maybe akin to something like a depression, or um, you know, a dark night of the soul, or Jung called it the dark sea night. And we make this, usually in psychology, we make this a bad thing. We want to treat this and we want to cure people of this. But I'm saying that this is possibly a necessary part of how we live as a system, to spend some time in this place of collapse and reorganization, which is healthy so that we can come up into a kind of transcendence and achieve a new status and identity. And this is like an initiation to a new level. Now, for sure, if you stay too long in the hole, 
then possibly, uh, you know, this is where you want to find support or get help. And I completely do an awful lot of work in the dark. So I, I understand that and I, I see it as a necessary thing. But I think for the most part, uh, we've looked at psychology as a kind of a cure this and cut these things off and try to keep this real steady state, which isn't healthy for anybody or any kind of a system. I hope that makes sense. Right. And you know, I think Carl Jung was the first to say that we need to tend and befriend all of these parts of ourselves that we don't like or we're ashamed of or, you know, are kind of our shadowy parts so that we can actually become more whole. Because wholeness is not necessarily goodness, it's a both and. And so I'm going to relate this now to panarchy theory a little bit. I'm going very quickly through this. So, uh, you know, just to give you this example, so while there's that one diagram, panarchy theory is in the figure eight, and it uh, was named after the god of nature, Pan, uh, by Holling and Gutterson. And, you know, so just using the example, they got it out of forestry. So the example is this, um, you know, heavily uh, forested area that is actually very mature and nothing's moving and nothing's changing and so it goes up into a bifurcation point where perhaps it has something like a big fire and it has a release state where it goes into the dark where that would be the back loop and you know we might say oh my gosh there's been a fire this is terrible but of course that's possibly what we need to release nitrogen and to pop seeds and to you know change up this particular forest so that when it reorganizes and comes back as forest, it's going to come back slightly differently. Uh, a little bit less, but also more of other things. And then it continues to go into these cycles. And these cycles don't repeat uh, exactly uh, the same way they've gone uh, previously. What they do is they actually fractal. They're all slightly different. They spiral out. And it moves over space and time. They're small and fast cycles, there's medium cycles, and there's large and slow cycles. So you can see how this is also can relate to human nature. You know, that we need these darknesses. We sometimes need a good fire, uh, you know, just to burn off some of the dross and reorganize ourselves and bring ourselves back. And that's also because we need to grow <laughs> and we need to uh, be able to let go of certain things we no longer need for that journey. Um, so here we go. So this whole arche theory is that we're holes and parts. I've used the Russian dolls here. And while the Russian dolls are a kind of a nested uh, look at, uh, you know, holons and systems, um, Russian dolls aren't an open system, whereas humans are. Ecological and social systems are open, made up of interdependent components, structured and nested. OK. So some points to consider. All complex systems, human and biophysical, experience periods of relative stability, collapse, and reorganization. So it's just not being afraid of the, the times when we actually have to let things go and surrender and let things reorganize. Many of our current political, economic, and biophysical systems are highly unstable right now and have reached a tipping point, or they're now in a state of collapse. So this brings to mind that, you know, that perhaps doesn't have to be a bad thing. There can also be something that can come out of that dark time, out of that reorganization that could possibly be better. In psychological terms, we call it break down to break through, you know, on both the personal and the collective level. And perhaps this is a necessary experience. When systems are highly unstable, when they're at that bifurcation point, it doesn't take much to influence their trajectory. You know, it's just a puff of air that can really be, uh, make a, a difference to that tipping point. And the notion that the status quo is unsustainable, that a creative, perhaps a creative maladjustment might be needed for a more sustainable, compassionate society that's healthier and more connected. So the main context that I'm working with here in, in terms of eco-psychology and systems thinking is nature is teacher, mirror, co-therapist, companion. And what we do to the one, we do to the other. So if we're going to throw our garbage into the river, it's always going to go downstream and affect the people. So we're so interconnected that we can't do something without troubling the other. So we're part of, not apart from nature. And in fact, we forget often we are nature, uh, made of star stuff, the same patterns and um, 
you know, um, atoms that every other living being has, including we have an ecological identity. So this is the fun part, the crayon part. And yes, Steve, we have crayons. Um, so if everybody would just uh, take a moment, put both feet on the floor, step, let go of anything, any pens or anything that you have, just indulge me in this. This is one of the activities that we do, um, just to do some remembering. So please shut your eyes and take a deep breath and listen to the peacock crying as if there's no tomorrow. Yep. And just, yeah, deep belly breath into the belly and just relax your shoulders. And try to imagine a place you went to as a child, something you love to do as a child in nature. And if it wasn't as a child, perhaps it's something you did when you were a little bit older. But try to take yourself back to a place, a time. Just notice who's there with you. Notice what you're doing. Are you lying out looking at clouds? Are you floating in a boat? Are you building sandcastles? What are you doing? Who are you with? Just take a moment and remember what it was like to be untethered and alive, connected, just playing as a child. Continue to breathe. And slowly, as you open your eyes, please take up a crayon and draw a picture of this. And this is called thunderstorming. This is an activity called, called thunderstorming. So it's really about just drawing something very simple. If it's lightning, you're just going to draw the lightning symbol. It's not fine art. We don't have a lot of time. Hi. But just drawing something of that earliest childhood memory in nature. What were you doing? Who were you with? Just a very simple drawing. I have to say, I just love watching people draw with crayons. <laughs> Makes my heart glad. Yeah. Okay, so we're just doing a kind of truncated version of this. It's got many more parts to it, but I'd encourage you now to turn to a neighbor and show them your drawing, if you will, if you feel you want to share, and um, just explain a little bit about what you were doing and what you loved and then be sure to give them enough time to do that too and so Steve you're going to have to go play with someone. Yeah. Okay I'm coming over. <laughs> okay everybody thanks. I hope you've had a chance to share. Uh, the whole notion of the whole notion of the, uh, the eco story and looking for your ecological identity, your early underpinnings, is just to pull on some of those threads of what Carl Jung said are our natural powers and proclivities and passions. Because often then we go off to school or, you know, we are raised by our siblings or the church or whatever, our parents, and many of these things get pushed aside for other more important things. So this is kind of a way for students or in my practice for clients to remember something that they loved to do when they were younger. And this gets us back into this kind of web of life out of the flatland of interior, of um, the flatland of not being connected. I just want to quickly introduce the four quadrant model because this speaks to interiority. So I'm going to move off the mic again. In the four quadrant model, this gets us back out of the flatland again and gets us more into this juicy inside out kind of inward agency and communion. So in, in the four quadrant model, which I think should probably be round, but you can see there's a web in there. Uh, it's not only the natural body, my, so we look over at the it, the objective material body. I am a body standing here in this room. I'm also part of larger systems of this university, of this city, of this country, but I also have thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories and perceptions. That's my interiority that you can't see likely. Sometimes on my face you can, sometimes in my body you can. And then I'm also part of this larger collective of meaningful relationships and ancestry um, and, uh, you know, so this is the interior, this is the exterior, this is the collective, this is the individual, this is the agency, the inward, and the communion outward. So I just wanted to bring it into that frame. So 
then we ask ourselves, if humans have this exteriority and interiority, do all natural systems have interiority? So animals obviously have interiority. They have feelings and you know, they can remember and they, you know, it's, all of this is now you know, really common uh, knowledge. But do trees and flowers and other plants have consciousness? This is where we're getting into some of the quantum science now that's starting to uh, answer that question. And what about mountains? You know, what about rocks? Does a rock have a soul? Well, for 99% of human history, nature was enchanted and alive. And we lived in close proximity to nature, to the rhythms and the tides and the seasons. And this is what James Hillman, Carl Jung called anima mundi. This is uh, world soul. And this wonderful fellow, who I got to meet before he died, Arne Ness, uh, was the, coined the, the term deep ecology, or our eco-self. He was very interested in the ecological identity. Uh, and he uh, said, you know, we can't just do this surface ecology anymore. We have to go to the interiority, this subtle ecology that's invisible, um, and move past in human form from our individual egos to this more connected biosphere. So he said moving from egocentric to ecocentric kind of, you know, an inside-out job. But we live in an urbanized world where 50% of us uh, live in cities. Uh, in Canada, it's 80%. Um, we spend 90% of our time indoors, most of us. This is a generalization. It's based on a survey that was done in 2015. 5% of our time in cars and one hour outside a day, if we're lucky. Uh, the average child spends six hours a day of screen time, TV, video, computers. Um, my friend and neuroscientist Paul Lopal tells me that there are studies now in four to six year olds that um, if they spend more than four hours a day in screen time that they're measuring shrinkage of their prefrontal cortex and, and that doesn't grow back. <laughs> so that's changing and shaping our brains, how we're relating to technology, which I don't make a bad thing, I just think it's a tool, it's a thing, it's not the thing. So we have research evidence now, and this is uh, Yulrich's, um, that's Roger's work on one tree. So he said, just by having one tree outside of a hospital window or a dormitory, uh, you know, changes everything. People improve their recovery in hospitals, students' test scores went up, their moods went up, uh, job satisfaction. We all know we want a window at railroads, um, you know, to look out and to just feel part of something larger than ourselves. There is more satisfaction reduced ADD and ADHD symptoms. And then there's this um, take on the Japanese um, uh, wandering in the woods, walking in the woods, or sitting in a forest to access the phytons, the natural phytochemicals that are released by trees and actually permeate uh, into our bodies. It's called forest bathing or shinrin yuko. There's lots of research now that says it lowers your blood pressure and alleviates some um, you know, inflammation and uh, really makes you feel so much better. Uh, so long quote, Teddy Rorschach, he's an eco-psychologist. It's possible then that every nature poet since Wordsworth has been right in telling us our sanity depends upon access to wilderness and natural wonders, upon the companionship of trees and animals, and above all, the reverence we experience in the presence of the inhumanly magnificent. If so, then healing the wounded psyche may require that we find ways to prescribe nature, indeed. Uh, wonderful indigenous scholar Robin Wall Kimmerer uh, calls for a kin-centric view. In her language, there is he and she pronouns, but there is no it. So uh, their word is ki, or earth. Uh, for um, other than he or she, and the plural would then be kin. So that goes back to natural relative rather than natural resource. Uh, and this fits with traditional peoples not seeing the world as subject-object, but rather subject-subject communion. Uh, and it really challenges our Western views. And so I maybe redo the four-quadrant model to be a thou and a thou rather than an it and an its, if we're really talking about communion. Or in modern vernacular, that's Martin Buber's term, <clears throat> the Hasidic scholar, the I-thou kind of relationship. I am because we are. Uh, maybe today we might say I-you. You know, you and I are so similar, even though we look different. 
So a concentric worldview says, you know, what if natural systems have interiority? If everything in the biospheric world was a thou or a you, you know, how would we act? How would we be? And this is one of my teachers and mentors in this work. Um, she's just done profoundly beautiful, elegant, educating and um, research. She's a Buddhist. Um, Joanna Macy, she lives in Berkeley. She's been doing this work for about 40 years um, with Arnie Ness and others. And she says, we're not in a climate crisis. We're in a crisis of perception. Um, you know, and this great kind of unraveling is needed. Um, you know, there's business as usual. We kind of need to unravel. And then we have this chance at a turning. Um, and it requires a different idea of ourselves and our relationship to all life, um, which, you know, dictates that we need more empathy and compassion to understand that we all belong together. And I, I love, we had a conversation recently where we decided that ethics, we thought, meant treating everything as if we belong together. It would just be a wild ethical approach. So I'm going to track my research now. I've got a little bit of time of what I've been interested in. So back in 20, uh, 2004, I did my MED at SFU, and um, I did a, a project called, uh, I did a final thesis called Winged Seeds, Essential Inquiry, Grounds for Learning, because I was really interested in taking learning outside. Um, it was still pretty new in some ways, and I was really interested in the intimacy and the interplay of those interactions, what happened. Um, and I thought that there was implications for maybe how we'd behave and act and um, I kind of called it a curriculum vitae, you know, like kind of living disciplines, taking our math, our, sci our science, our literature, everything outside and just seeing what kind of uh, interplay we could have. So that was my early days. I started to look into things rather than just at them. And then I really didn't do much other than I was the founding director of continuing studies for about 10 years. <laughs> and then I did my PhD and it's called Wild Returns tracking the epistemological and ecological implications of learning as an initiatory journey toward true vocation and soul. Done and done. Probably the longest title they've seen at UVic in a long time. Um, and so from that place, I looked at uh, Joseph Campbell's three central terms um, that he, three central themes that he found in all human culture, uh, namely separation, threshold or initiation, and return. And I looked at Western culture's uh, incongruence with nature as the kind of separation piece and how, you know, even in schools, we separated out our subjects. Uh, and we've had an overt focus on uh, careerism and uh, job finding and profit making. And uh, so this really reinforces dualistic thinking for students. And I think in some ways we failed in that way. And as a counterbalance for the threshold initiation part, I was on a, I took a vision fast in the Abajo Mountains in Colorado and spent four days of solo time on the land uh, with no food, uh, no people, just water. And um, from that place, there was an awful lot revealed to me. I mean, that's a non-ordinary state. So we get into a bit of the wild there. Uh, some might call it crazy, but I might offer this is the kind of crazy we might need a bit more of. Because I did receive some pretty um, powerful teachings for me that I could bring back, which brings me to the return portion. And when you come back from a journey like that, you don't bring a gift, a wrapped gift. You bring your own self in your own bearing and how you'll be in the world. So I was looking and calling for a less codified, more enhanced, more embodied, embedded, arts-based, nature-based approach to teaching and learning and supporting teachers to find a, you know, a deeply fulfilling way to belong uh, by bringing this kind of work, a kind of living ecology of uh, teaching. You know, I was kind of curious about how we might turn around the whole human in order to kind of turn around our world. That's fitting with Macy's work. Um, right. And so more recently, with my esteemed colleague, Jeff Bird, we uh, wrote this wonderful chapter called A Matter of Life and Death, Tourism, Essential Remembrance. So we departed from this abstract arm's length idea about tourism, and we talked about the senses mediating between mind and body that informs a kind of visceral intelligence or understanding and meaning making that we will find in the body. Uh, you know, this is from people touching headstones or walking through a battlefield or wearing the uniform of the liberator. 
um, and how that stimulates the senses and the imagination and creates this kind of, you know, more metaphysical, timeless truth about remembrance. Um, and we even went so far as to say that perhaps, you know, if we include more of ourselves in this remembrance, if we look deeper, that there, these might hold the cultural keys for us to, um, you know, not act in ways of war. You know, if we look at past and present, life and death, all these dualisms, these dichotomies, we bring them together, war and peace, perhaps we'll be able to integrate this and not have these kinds of, um, you know, really heinous experiences to look back on. Uh, and then I've just done, um, just finished uh, uh, in chapter 19, Mindscapes and Landscapes, Rendering of Self Through a Body of Work uh, for a Brill Sense publication called Identify Identity Landscapes. And uh, it's based on uh, an artography exercise I do in 509 with students. And these are three, four examples of this. Uh, and these are, so artography is artist, researcher, teacher, so that this, um, you know, connects their, their ability to create something with their research, with their ability to teach and, and offer what they've come to know to the world. Um, so you can see that these are quite incredible. They've spent time immersed in nature doing Joanna Macy's work. Also, they've learned about integral ecology and systems. And so here they are presenting themselves at, in the moment, uh, a snapshot of themselves. So you've got galaxy guts and mountainous shoulders and rivered arms and legs and ancestry and communities. And, you know, um, when someone traces a body for the other, it's never exact. Sometimes you get a perfect hand and sometimes you get a catcher's mitt. So I say, go with what's coming on the page. And this woman had her hair. Uh, you know, traced on the page, and as an ocean health educator, she saw fit to create a shark over her body and focused on some of those shadowy aspects of the work that she does. Just stunning. Another woman who felt quite divided and cut in half between science, uh, for natural science and social science, and that was her portrayal there. It was just a, you know, there's one big hand and one little hand. And this woman, why I included this one, is her body was simple, but she had these grasses for hair. And on the final day, we put these life-size bodies up, and it's a kind of an art gallery walk in the class where every student speaks about what they've learned and kind of riffs off their bodies. And this woman had ridden her bike in that day, and she saw the exact same grasses at the top of the hill, but there was garbage in it. And she just burst into tears and she said, there's garbage in my hair. So she had this deep identification with uh, grass, her hair, the world. I mean, you know, that kind of warms the cockles of anybody who's, you know, aiming at um, compassion and empathy and deep identification through this process. Um, what else do I want to say? I think that's it. Uh, and then I've been looking at education. I kind of like playing with words, and I like a good bog. You know, who doesn't love skunk cabbage? But I love a bog because that's where things happen, right? Things die and grow. It's an ecotone. It's where these systems meet. It's messy. And I think that's kind of what education is about. It can't be really prescribed in some ways. So Ann Dale and I got going on um, a couple of uh, chapters, in, one in a social ecology book and another one in a McGill publication on developing change agents. And we used our graduate certificate residency with its live cases and curricular design that included like human libraries and uh, open spaces and maker space to kind of bring um, an idea of how we might, um, you know, transform ourselves through that kind of learning at the edge in the in-between spaces of knowing and not knowing where students really co-create the curriculum with us as we go. Um, and yet that sounds a little bit lazy. <laughs> we have a, you know, a lot planned and within that there are co-creators. Um, and, and why that's important is because of all the challenges we face right now, it's gonna, it's gonna take creativity and innovative thinking and this understanding of our interconnectedness. So if you want people to build sustainable communities, then you, know, um, you want to be able to convene these spaces for them to uh, you know, start wise relating and uh, for a change. Uh, and then I had a poem published, because I can, I love poetry. Uh, I just threw my hat in a ring, and it's um, for a group out of the States uh, in a book called A Walk in Nature, Poetic Encounters That Nourish the Soul. 
So that was fun. Uh, and now I'm working on metisage. I've been doing this for a few years. It's an indigenous-inspired approach to research. I've presented us at, at World Congress for EEC and at ECOM, um, creating workshops where people can uh, write short stories and then mix and mingle and braid their stories together to develop a kind of counter-narrative to disrupt some of the dominant stories we hear again and again. It's arts-informed, um, you know, it's a story kind of mixing. It plays on the word Métis, which comes from French meaning mix. And it's very surprising for people what comes of this work, and it really has implications for environmental education and contribution. Um, yeah, and it creates something greater than its parts, so it's really kind of a systems thinking approach. Um, and it resists barriers, it starts to blend and blur. A couple of conferences and presentations I've been to, because, you know, this is pretty new. I've only been about three years uh, being able to be out in the world. They let me out into the world. So Mickey and I, yay Mickey, we're going to UBC to do a forest walk shop where science and soul meet and merge. The poor pre-service teachers, they have no idea what we're going to do with them on Saturday, but we'll have our way with them. Um, I've presented methods of lived experience, hermeneutical phenomenology, ethnographies and heuristic analysis to uh, the Self-Design Institute in Seattle. I'm doing, I've done Métissage, as I said, at Ecom. Um, again, I did Métissage down at World Congress. Um, How to Bring Soul to School for the Canadian Eco-Psych Network. The Dark Side of Leadership, looking at shadow work with the Leadership Conference a little while ago, and then Walking the Wild Curriculum. Steps to Becoming an Ecopedagogue, how to bring this for other teachers at the Nova Scotia uh, Ecom Conference. Uh, so I see teaching, supervising, researching, and my therapy practice all as research. I think this is all looking again, researching, looking twice at something, looking into rather than at something. And so some of the interventions and practices I use are, is the work that reconnects from Joanna Macy. Uh, Place bonding is like an immersion in nature, the slowing down and listening, uh, or slow teaching, journaling, time in solitude, art making, forest bathing, self-designed ceremonies, cross-species dialogue, dialogic inquiry and open space, council practice, poetry. So all of these things mixing and mingling to inform and shape uh, the way that I can bring a teaching practice and support others in their practices and the ways that they'll live and go forward to their organizations and families and communities. And I'm really quite interested in grief as a competency. I think this is that back loop, that darkness that I've talked about. I don't think we do this very well, that we need to know, um, you know, that our grief is welcome in our lives, that this is a time of difficulty. You know, there's not one environmental student who comes to us who doesn't do the math, who hasn't already, you know, looked at what's happening and where we're headed. And Perhaps the ship is too far gone to turn around. However, this is a sign of our compassion and our humanness. If we can express this grief and do it in a safe way, do it in a way that it's facilitated, so we come out the other side with the eyes to see how we can live and how we can live together as a planet. And yeah, this is Joanna's words. We've received uh, an inestimable gift to be alive in this <clears throat> in this beautiful self-organizing universe to participate in the dance of life with senses to perceive it, lungs that breathe it, organs that draw nourishment from it, is a wonder beyond words. And it is, moreover, an extraordinary privilege to be accorded a human life with this self-reflexive consciousness which brings awareness of our own actions and the ability to make choices. Let us choose to take part in the healing of the world. It doesn't mean saving the world. It doesn't mean we're going to go out and save the world. It means fully belonging to it and knowing our place within it. How much time do we have? Oh, we have time. Good. I have another exercise. Oh, a quick one. So pick a person. And, um, you know, my nephew always said, Aunt Hill, I know when you're paying attention to me because your nose is facing my nose, which is very good <laughs> advice. So if you're going to be working with someone, make sure your nose, you're not just going to give it one of these. Make sure your nose is facing their nose. And we'll answer this first open sentence. So pick a partner. OK, we don't have much time. Just complete this sentence. <laughs> <laughs> don't be there, go away. All right.
Okay, everybody, thank you for that. Um, so, you know, Joanna Macy says we have to call on our moral imaginations and act our age, all 4.5 billion years of it. Um, but as I said, when systems are at a tipping point, it doesn't take much, it, you know, it's called the butterfly effect, to create large-scale events that will change so much. And I, I often look at it this way. So there's this egg that's cracking. It seems like complete destruction. You know, can you imagine? You see this thing and it's breaking apart and there's this unwieldy, hairless thing underneath. Well, what's getting ready to be born? I always say if we look at things as a system, when we're losing something, we're also coming into something else that's probably mysterious and unknown to us, but can we turn toward it and uh, see what's coming, be part of that conversation? Uh, and so this is a, a kind of a, a, a quote from Clarissa Pinkola Estes that I love. It says, I urge you, ask you, gentle you, to please not spend your spirit dry by bewailing these difficult times. Especially don't lose hope. Was particularly because the fact is we're made for these times. Yes, for years we've been learning, practicing, been in training, and just waiting to meet on this extraordinary, this exact plane of ex engagement. I cannot tell you often enough that we are definitely the leaders we've been waiting for, and that we've been raised since childhood for this time precisely. So my future research will look at more about metissage, place bonding. I've been asked by Ecopsychology, the peer-reviewed journal, to write something on the intimacy of place. I'm working on an article with Anne on can beauty save us, because it's been trying for thousands of years. Just look at flowers on your table. Uh, grief as a competency. And then I've been tracking methodologies back to the myths, like hermeneutics and phenomenology and heuristic analysis. Don't you love that photo? That's from one of our students. So uh, I just want to thank you for putting up with a kind of a, a journey with me through my research over the last little while. And while it looks a little bit errant and disparate, you can see that the premise of it is eco-psychology and this interconnectedness of all life. And I'm just um, moving in these directions that are curious to me. And um, you know, I can start answering some of those questions that, you know, really have no right to go away at the beginning. So I'd um, love to have questions. And also, maybe you wonder why you have the jeweler's loop on the table and the natural objects. Uh, put your eye right up to the jeweler's loop and right up to the natural object, and you'll start to see patterns. And um, do it with your hand. So you have to put your eye right up, Jamie, and your, the, uh, the item right up to the loop. And you'll start to see, bye, thank you. You'll start to see how everything is patterned after the same uh, you know, all the patterns match your hand, your veins, rivers of the world, etc. Now I'm rambling. Okay. Leaving the podium. Oh, I'm not leaving the podium. Well, we could probably do a few minutes of questions. Sure. Yeah. Okay, great.